Great to be here at the Stennis Space Center, America's premier propul propulsion testing center, and I cannot think of a better place to roll out NASA's 2021 budget request than right here, where we are ushering in a civilization-changing era of human spaceflight. I want to especially recognize Representative Palazzo, who is with us today, and I'd like to recognize others with us here today, staff from the offices of Senator Wicker, Senator Hyde-Smith, and Senator Cassidy, and the mayor of Slidell, Mayor Cromer. Where's Mayor Cromer? He gave me the great uh, the city, the, the key to the city here of, of Slidell, and uh, I haven't used it yet, but I intend to. So um, I just, I want to look at this rocket for a second. You, you just heard the center director say that we're going to the moon by 2024. That rocket in the B-2 test stand is in fact the moon. That is the SLS rocket, store, core stage complete. We're doing the green run right here at Stennis. That's for you, Representative Palazzo. And we're going to be taking that rocket to the moon when we launch Artemis 1. So thank you all for the great work on all of that activity. Please join me in thanking Rick Gilbrecht and his Stennis team for making this amazing event possible. Thank you, Rick. I would also like to thank Eileen Drake and everyone at Aerojet Rocketdyne for allowing us to use their building and for creating these beautiful displays, including the RL-10 in front of me, the RS-25s behind me. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you, Aerojet Rocketdyne. History is being made here as well as all across our storied agency. Our nearly 18,000 person strong workforce is developing cutting edge technology and expanding our scientific knowledge with ever greater discoveries. From the newest members on our team to the most senior, your unrelenting determination and teamwork are what has made NASA ranked the best place to work in the federal government for the eighth consecutive year. Thank you, NASA. The late night's dogged persistence of NASA employees is the mold into which history is poured. In no metaphoric terms, we are in truth leading the world into a new and dynamic era of spaceflight. The nation is proudly behind us in this endeavor, and I am happy to announce that President Donald Trump's fiscal year 2021 budget request invests in NASA more than $25 billion. No. That's a 12% increase, <laughs> and it includes $3.3 billion for a human landing system. This is a 21st century budget worthy of 21st century space exploration and one of our strongest budgets in NASA history. Last week, during his State of the Union address, President Trump challenged our nation to venture farther into space than ever before. Quote, we must remember that America has always been a frontier nation. And then he asked Congress to, quote, fully fund the Artemis program to ensure that the next man and the first woman on the moon will be American astronauts. And he said, in fact, he said, quote, use this as a launching pad to ensure that America is the first nation to plant its flag on Mars. If the president's support for NASA wasn't clear before, it should be obvious now. The administration and a bipartisan coalition in the Congress are committed to utilizing the great talents of this agency we call NASA. Their support for what we are doing is not empty rhetoric. They are backing up our vision of a renewed era of discovery by giving NASA ever increasing budgets every year and now we must deliver. It is up to us to deliver. It was only 10 months ago 
that Vice President Mike Pence announced the President's policy to accelerate the Artemis program's timeline and land the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. He instructed all of us to adopt a spirit of relentless determination and a renewed sense of focus. No one embodies this more than astronaut Christina Cook, who just last week finished her nearly year-long mission aboard the International Space Station. During her rookie mission, she broke records for the longest single space flight by a woman and ventured outside the station on six different spacewalks, including not just the first one, but the first three all-woman extravehicular activities in history. Like Christina, the Artemis program's bold, bold vision must be matched by our unflinching devotion to what is necessary to advance the nation farther and faster than ever before. Nowhere has this been more apparent than the progress made on the Space Launch System rocket and the Orion crew capsule. The 2021 budget, and Marshall, and Mishu, and Kennedy, and Johnson, they should all be happy. Everybody in NASA should be happy. This is important. The 2021 budget fully funds SLS and Orion. Let's talk about Orion for a second. Orion is the first human spacecraft we've built for deep space missions in over a generation. Last year, engineers, engineers fully assembled the Orion spacecraft in preparation for the Artemis I mission and are now halfway through the final testing at Plumbrook, St Plumbrook Station in Ohio. After final testing is complete, the Orion will be returned to the Kennedy Space Center and be, be stacked atop the Space Launch System in preparation for the Artemis I mission. Let's talk about SLS. The Space Launch System rocket is the foundation of our 21st century space exploration missions to the Moon and to Mars. Its unprecedented power and capabilities will send American astronauts farther than ever before. Just a few months ago, engineers completed assembling the core stage and integrating the four RS-25 engines. In fact, the RS-25 engines behind me. And right here at Stennis Space Center, we will conduct the green run test for the SLS. That's for you, Congressman Palazzo. <laughs> Congressman Palazzo stuck around just, he, he's got to get to the airport to help us with our funding, but he stuck around just to hear me say that line, just so everybody's aware. <laughs> <laughs> I said it twice. He just gave me, yeah, he said it twice. That's good. This is a 212-foot tall core stage. It's the largest rocket ever built by the agency and a monumental engineering feat in its own right. It is a testament to American enterprise and ingenuity with more than a 1,000 large and small businesses in 44 states contributing to the design and the assembly. The SLS rocket is, in fact, America's rocket. Let's go out to the B-2 test stand here at Stennis. Thanks, sir. I'm astronaut Rajachari. Hi, I'm Dawn Davis. And like you said, we're standing here at Stennis Space Center in front of the B-2 stand. And just like there's a lot of history and heritage there at Aerojet Rocketdyne, where you guys are at, there's a whole bunch of history and heritage here at Stennis, but specifically this B-2 test stand. Everybody. Right now, we have loaded up the SLS core stage, which is going to launch the Artemis 1 You're mission on the unmanned test. But moment. before that, they're going to do a green run. Because like you mentioned, everybody. safety we're and reliability is key as we take on the challenges that await us as we go back to the moon and beyond. And the SLS is key because unlike the Saturn V and Apollo, we're going back to the moon to stay this time and to build a sustainable presence at the moon and Mars eventually. Not only are we going back to the moon though, but this year is super exciting in the astronaut office because there's three new vehicles in development all at the same time, something that's never happened in the agency. So besides SLS, we're also working with our commercial partners at SpaceX and Boeing to launch Americans from US soil back to the space station this year. And as you mentioned, Christina Cook just coming back, a great testament 
to overcoming the challenges of space, just like the engineers and scientists here at NASA be overcoming the challenges that await us as we move forward. So it's great, exciting to see the budget roll out and to know we have the support of the country and bipartisan support as we endeavor to take on these challenges. But in the near term, we're going to have to launch this rocket. And to do that, we have a green run test coming up. So here to talk about that is Don Davis. So right, Roger. Exciting times for NASA, but especially here at Tennis Space Center. As the SLS core stage resides right now on our historic B2 test stand in preparation for green run testing. So the green run testing provides us the first opportunity to do integrated testing of the core stage components, starting with individual testing and actually culminating with the firing of all four RS-25 engines, generating over 2 million pounds of thrust, just like you have done launch. So exciting times again as we prepare for our voyage back to the moon. I can tell you in the astronaut office, there's uh, quite a bit of competition going on to see who's going to get to be able to sit in the front row of this test a few hundred feet away and watch this impressive feat and impressive test when all four of those things fire up at the same time. So very excited to be here and so excited to be a part of this amazing year and to have the graduate astronaut candidate training and to be now part of the team that's going to go back to the moon and beyond. Back to you, sir. <laughs> now. In full disclosure, Raja Chari and Don Davis are not actually at the B2 test stand. They're in the room right now. Would you two please stand up so we can give you some applause? <laughs> After the green run, the next time this core stage will roar to life, we'll be on the launch pad at Kennedy for the Artemis I mission to the moon. After Artemis 1, these RS-25 engines behind me will launch American astronauts to the moon for the first time since Apollo on Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. Now, that's Artemis 2. That's an Artemis 2 engine, one of four for Artemis 2, and that's one of four for Artemis 3. And I want to make sure that we thank Aerojet Rocketdyne for their amazing work to put these engines on order and get them complete so that we can get this rocket launched Thank you, Aerojet Rocket Dime. Another pair of components vitally important to the Artemis program and our eventual missions to Mars are the human landing system and the gateway. The President's 2021 budget supports these critical elements of the Ar Artemis architecture that will enable us to explore the moon in a way that's never been done before like Gateway, or The Gateway, or as sometimes I call it, The Gateway to Mars, is the civilization-changing technology that will propel us to Mars for the first time in human history. Constructing this space vehicle in orbit around the moon will help us prove the technology we need for an eventual crewed mission to the Red Planet. NASA's Science Mission Directorate and NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate We'll, we'll need to work together like never before to make this a reality. Parts of our gateway to Mars are already under development and the 2021 budget will allow us to start construction on the others. Prototype thrusters that take advantage of solar electric propulsion developed by NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate were completed and have now been delivered by commercial partners last year. <laughs> Thank you again, Aerojet Rocketdyne. <laughs> the human landing system is another critical element of the Artemis architecture. One of the most noteworthy features of the 2021 fiscal budget, <laughs> this is crazy, one of the most noteworthy features of the 2021 fiscal budget is the 3.3 billion dollars President Trump has directed for development of the human landing system. 2020 marked the first time we've had direct funding for a human landing system since the Apollo program. The human landing system, or HLS, will be used to ferry American astronauts between the lunar surface and the gateway. Last year, our agency's HLS team went above and beyond the call of duty in response to the Vice President's 2024 announcement. In record time, they executed the first step in calling for industry proposals for an entirely new multi-billion dollar program. What would normally have taken NASA two years was accomplished 
in roughly six months. NASA is serious about meeting our 2024 goal, and this team's excellent work demonstrates our desire to get the mission right. The HLS team is currently hard at work, evaluating several proposals received from industry, and is preparing to make final awards in the coming months. Thank you to the HLS team. Let's talk about a, a milestone long sought after that we will soon achieve. Returning human spaceflight to the United States of America. This year, we will once again launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil for the first time in nearly a decade. The emerging market in low Earth orbit where NASA is one customer among many is revolutionizing our ability to do more science, more exploration, and more technology development than ever before. Although our ultimate goal is far beyond low Earth orbit, what we do there is vital to exploration. The President's budget fully supports the International Space Station's missions to learn about human health in microgravity demonstrate cutting-edge technology and perform trailblazing science. The ISS is one of the most ambitious international collaborations ever even attempted. The relationships we have developed with the European, Japanese, Russian, and Canadian space agencies and all of the others are absolutely invaluable to NASA. And this year, this year we mark 20 years of continuous human presence aboard the International Space Station. I was speaking to a group of students at a university just last week, and, and it dawned on me that half of the people in the audience, 18, 19, even 20 years old, were, they never lived a day of their lives when there weren't people living and working in space. That is a monumental achievement, not just for the United States of America, but for the entire coalition of nations that we lead on the International Space Station. As we plan to go forward to the moon sustainably, we want to bring the American aerospace industry with us through a program that we call the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, CLIPS. CLIPS is fully supported by the 2021 budget and will utilize the capabilities of American industry to deliver 16 NASA science and technology payloads to the lunar surface starting next year. That means next year, we are putting payloads on the surface of the moon for the first time since 1972. Mm. Nice. Amazing. Let's go out to the Goddard Space Flight Center and get an update on some of these CLIPS missions. Hi, I'm Noah Petro at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. I'm a project scientist on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter an incredible spacecraft that we've had orbiting the moon now for over 10 years, creating the most amazing data set for our nearest neighbor in space, the moon. Now, as part of the Artemis program, NASA is working with multiple American companies to deliver new science to the lunar surface. We call it the Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLIPS. We've identified more than two dozen experiments to send to the surface with these small landers. The first 16 experiments are set to launch next year, and five of the experiments are being built right here at Goddard. With those experiments, we'll be able to learn about the composition of the surface of the moon, the dynamics of the interaction of the moon with the sun, and the presence and distribution of volatiles on the lunar surface. Now right here, I have a very small experiment. It's called the Lunar Retroreflector Array. It's a small set of uh, eight mirrors. This experiment will be mounted to the top of a lander, um, and so when it's sitting on the surface, we'll be able to shoot laser beams, whether we're shooting laser beams from a spacecraft orbiting overhead or a rover. This Laser beams and the interaction with this, these sets of mirrors will tell us exactly where the lander is in, on the surface of the moon. It will act as sort of a beacon. That one point will tell us exactly about where it is in space, and if we make those measurements repeatedly, we'll understand how that point is moving in space, and that can tell us something about the interior of the moon. So this is a very exciting opportunity from this incredibly small package. Now, I'm very happy to send you over to my colleague, Mehdi Benna, who's going to talk about his experiment called SEAL. Hey, you can see we are here in one of NASA's Goddard uh, cave rooms where we are uh, finishing the integration of the SEAL instrument. 
Uh, CL stands for the Surface and Exosphere Alterations by Landers. This instrument uh, will be a task of measuring how the tenuous uh, environment of the moon is altered by uh, the exhaust plumes of the lander. Uh, this will allow scientists to gain more insight in how future spacecraft landing may affect uh, solar samples that are collected in the vicinity. Uh, so that's uh, one of the things we uh, have going on at Goddard. We're very excited of being part of uh, NASA's uh, journey back to the moon. All right. We'll issue two more task orders this year for deliveries to the lunar surface in 2022, and two each each year thereafter, including one delivery for the Viper rover to search for polar ice as early as December of 2022. All right, let's talk about science and aeronautics and technology. The 2021 budget strongly supports NASA's full suite of science, aeronautics, and technology work. The president's budget is committed to an all of NASA approach in order to best move us into the next era of science and discovery. This includes supporting the decadal survey priorities identified by the science community, including history's first Mars sample return mission, the Europa Clipper, and more advanced Earth observation missions. Yesterday, we successfully launched Solar Orbiter from Cape Canaveral. Go Solar Orbiter. <laughs> This cooperative mission between the European Space Agency and NASA will conduct trailblazing science in heliophysics and give us our first images of the sun's poles. This budget also funds over 40 innovative science missions, accelerating our opportunities to do state-of-the-art science on the deepest parts of the universe, as well as right here on Earth. We are preparing to launch the long-anticipated James Webb Space Telescope in 2021, and this budget gives us the funds to do just that. This premier observatory will serve thousands of astronomers as they seek to better understand the universe. I'm gonna anchor here for a second. Think about this. When we talk about uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, we're talking about a telescope that will be somewhere around 10 degrees Kelvin almost absolute zero in temperature. It is going to see, for the first time in human history, the first light in the universe. It will be in infrared, it won't be in light, but that's because as the universe has expanded, it has gone from light waves to now infrared. That is gonna be an absolute stunning moment, not just in the history of the United States of America, but a stunning moment for our nation and for the world, and it will forever add chapters to science books and history books. Closer to Earth, the 2021 budget supports a robust fleet of next generation Earth observatory missions, including launches of Landsat 9, SWAT, and Sentinel 6A Mike Freilich. Sentinel 6A Mike Freilich was re recently renamed after NASA's longtime Earth Science Director. I would like everybody to give a round of applause to Mike Freilich and everything he has done for NASA Earth Science. Technology drives exploration. Technology drives exploration and technology development in the coming years will be essential for exploring the moon and preparing crews for long-term missions on Mars. This budget includes more than $1.5 billion for exploration technology in support of the Artemis program. Some examples include turning space waste into useful gases for long duration missions and using nuclear propulsion to accelerate our, our path to the red planet. The 2021 budget also strongly supports planetary science, including providing funds to study the celestial bodies around us like never before. The Mars 2020 rover is a very exciting mission that I anticipate also will rewrite textbooks. This summer we will launch this rover as part of our next generation robotic explorations. This mission will not only look for signs of habitable conditions on Mars in the ancient past, but also search for signs of past microbial life itself, and include, and I love this part, 
and include the first ever helicopter to fly in another world. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Mars 2020 will also test methods for producing oxygen from the Martian atmosphere for the first time and identify resources on the surface that could support our future astronauts' long-term missions. Furthermore, the Mars 2020 rover will initiate a long sought after mission of returning Martian rocks and soil to the Earth for further study. Let's go to NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab to hear more about this pioneering mission. Yay! here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now, it's been a dream of scientists for generations to bring back samples from the surface of Mars. And right now, the Mars 2020 rover mission is laying the groundwork. And that's why I'm in the in-situ instrument laboratory with Jessica Samuels, and she's here to tell us what's going on here. Well, we use this facility to develop and design our hardware and software systems for our Mars mission. And how does the sampling system work? So we have a drill on the end of our robotic arm, and as we are drilling the surface of Mars, we will be collecting pieces of Mars into the sample tube at that time. <laughs> we'll then transfer that sample tube into the inside of the rover and then seal it for storage as we continue to explore the surface. After we've collected a diverse set of samples, we will drop them off onto the surface and then have them there for our future uh, sample return mission to continue. Well, I know you have some tests to keep doing, and I'm actually going to go check out the next phase at a different lab. We're at a testing lab affectionately known as the Sandbox, and I'm here with Austin Nicholas. Now, can you explain how we are going to bring back samples from Mars? So, uh, starting from uh, after 2020 has deposited tubes on the surface, there are two more missions to go in bringing the tubes back to Earth. The first is a lander mission. It carries three major elements, a sample fetch rover and a sample transfer arm that lets you transfer the samples from the fetch rover into the rocket, and a Mars ascent vehicle, which is a rocket that brings the samples from Mars into space. Meanwhile, the orbiter has also launched from Earth in 2026 and is making its way towards Mars, and it will be in position by the time the rocket's fully loaded. The orbiter will then go to the sample container that the rocket's put into space, and then capture it, ultimately bringing them to Earth in 2031. That sounds complicated. <laughs> it is complicated, but fortunately not doing it alone. So we have a great partnership with the European Space Agency, and they're providing some major pieces of this mission. Within NASA, we've actually got a number of centers working on uh, all of the different pieces. So we're partnering with Marshall Space Flight Center for the Mars Ascent Vehicle, Langley and Ames for the Earth Entry Vehicle, Glenn for the sample fetch rover wheels, and we're partnering with Goddard for the orbiter payload. And so there's really a it's, a, it's a whole NASA effort to get more sample return done. Sounds like there is a lot of work to be done, but this all kicks off with the launch of Mars 2020 this summer in Cape Canaveral, Florida. And there's lots of excitement here as we get ready to make history. The Mars sample return mission is a high priority not only for the scientific knowledge it will provide, but also the opportunity it presents to tackle a difficult technological challenge. Remember, Mars 2020 is going to have the first Mars helicopter. The Mars sample return will include the first ever rocket launched from another planet. For more than 50 years, the aeronautics mission directorate at NASA has advanced game-changing technologies like fuel-efficient turbofan engines, fuel-saving winglets, lighter composite structures, and digital fly-by-wire to shape modern aviation as we know it. Truly, NASA is with you when you fly. Today, we are reinventing aviation for the next 50 years, where aircraft look different and aircraft are powered differently. The world of aviation is about to change forever, and the men and women of NASA are leading those changes. The 2021 budget fully supports aeronautics research that enables breakthroughs such as our X-57 all-electric experimental airplane scheduled to fly later this year. Lessons learned from the X-57 are already being shared with the new electric vertical lift vehicle market. We are also moving forward on the testing of the low boom flight demonstrator with an anticipated first flight in 2022. A successful, quiet, supersonic flight demonstration 
will pave the way for overland supersonic flight that could cut commercial flight times in half. And the budget supports one aeronautics project that in my opinion has one of the greatest potentials to change all of our lives, urban air mobility. In the near future, semi and fully autonomous vehicles will provide many new services and carry packages and people in and around cities large and small. A big part of the urban air mobility world is the small drones that will transform the commercial delivery for industry, emergency response, and agriculture monitoring, and so much more. Friends, this is who we are at NASA. All across this agency, I see people that perfectly exemplify the dedication, urgency, and uncommon commitment that was called for by Vice President Mike Pence just 10 months ago. This year, we must build on our success by continuing to devote ourselves to the agency mission. The milestones we hit this year through the Green Run test, that's for you again, Palazzo. He's gonna hit me later. The milestones we hit this year through the Green Run testing of the SLS and in launching and the, the launching of astronauts on American-made rockets from American soil will place us on the cusp of era-defining space exploration. And the science and technology we are working on right now will prepare us in this new exploration to take humanity's next giant leap to Mars. Friends, we are the Artemis generation and we are going. Thank you so much. To the moon, baby. Uh, yeah, so it's probably and there's a lineup of females there. and males, um, astronauts to go yeah, to the moon. This will be on loop, right? I want to see uh, you guys enjoy seeing a little bit of, of our sample return. Thank you for being here. So that's Austin Nicholas. Exciting, very exciting. Meet him later on today. Um, and in Let's the building, I've had eyes on him, so I know he's here. Uh, Dr. Thomas Zubukin and Dr. Mike Watkins, our center director, and then. AA for SMD, sorry, that's a lot of alphabet soup. Let me start that over again. Um, the JPL and NASA Center leadership are here to like take your questions. They're here, and they're on their way down now. I think they've been up in the penthouse suite uh, watching the administrator's remarks. If you hang in there, guys, and they'll be I'll down show here in a, a couple minutes, and I'm ready to take your March. questions. Let me just go ahead you know, just and like get a globe. some things back Earth up globe. here on the screen. actually a Mars globe. There we go. Beauty. <laughs> Mad props to Robert up there in the booth. Mm -hmm. I'll show it to you now. All right, yes, yeah, they're on their way. Does anybody have any questions so far? I mean, other, aside from like all the things about the science and the engineering, anything about the logistics of today? Take on Mars. Okay, so when we're done with your remarks here in the Q&A, oh, yes. She's plugging the computer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I believe the Mars 2020 is uh, going to be landed here. The room. <laughs> I read. Uh, I hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> it's an area called Olympus Mons, right here. Olympus Mons. Um, we can print some more and bring them up. I don't have any more on on me right now. So if you could take a picture of the person next to yours, then you have a soft copy of it. Um, so just so you know, when we're done with Q and A so awesome, here right? today, the NASA social group, we're going to adjourn upstairs. Look at all these indentations. So um, we'll pack up our stuff when we're done. Hopefully, Dr. Z and, and Dr. Watkins will want to do a group photo with us. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if that's the case, we'll do the group photo. We'll pack up our stuff and head up. I love the um, names. We've got some members of traditional the names media for the here with us today. Thank you so much. 
uh, and you'll have some more time to do some stand-ups and one-on-one -on -one interviews with Dr. Watkins and Dr. Zabuka. Janet, Lainey, am I forgetting anything? Jerry? Good. Okay. I know, just pregnant pause. Thank you. Yes. Hello, Janet. The people who are coming in to do the Q&A, what's their... What's their... Okay. So this guy, all right, that's, that's the, the, the head honcho Look. of JPL, Dr. Michael Watkins. There may be uh, he's on the our pole. center director. And then he will be joined by, I'm and just then let's look at the south pole. Sure walk in on me. Oh, they're right there. Maybe okay, I that's Dr. over there too. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> a scorched moon. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Okay. Oh, we'll like if it was oh, mine. We <laughs> welcome, welcome, everybody. A uh, big round of applause for our center director. So thank you for welcoming um, our center director here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Dr. Michael Watkins. Uh, and he is joined by Dr. Thomas Zubukin. Uh, at Dr. Underscore Thomas Z on Twitter, head of the Science Mission Directorate from NASA headquarters, and he came to us via Kennedy Space Center, where he was there for the launch of the Solar Orbiter just last night. And then we've also got Lieutenant General uh, Larry James, who is the Deputy Director for JPL. And okay, um, you know we're very. Uh, Happy to be joined by, uh, uh, by Dr. Zerbukin. Um, <clears throat> the budget, and uh, Thomas and I will uh, tag team this a little bit. Um, you know, the budget um, is very positive for JPL. It's very positive for NASA as a whole. Uh, a lot of the growth is in the Artemis program. Go the camera, guys. Um, as you know, JPL's forte since we started has really been the robotic uh, exploration program for the science mission directorate. So that's what we're going to talk about mostly. Um, it does continue all of our. Um, flagship missions uh, that we've been very heavily invested in that have been very important to us for the last few decades. Uh, this includes Mars 2020, which is actually gonna gonna start shipping to the Cape tonight. Uh, the rover's mm -hmm. packed up, we're gonna ship it out tonight. Uh, to Mars Air Force Base, we're team gonna fly to, uh, to Florida, to, to uh, Kennedy Space Center. It also continues Europa Clipper. Uh, it continues the development, uh, early development of Mars sample return. And Mars Sample Return. Now, these are missions, Europa Clipper, Mars Sample Return. These are missions and programs that we've talked about for decades. Um, these, are, these are not just another Mars mission. Mars Sample Return is a campaign that's been top ranked by the Decatur Survey for a number of years. It's a mission we've been trying to get going for more than 20 years. Uh, so these are spectacular missions. Same with Europa Clipper to explore uh, this ice covered world um, uh, of, uh, at the moon of Jupiter Europa. Um, that is really a tremendous candidate for life. So these are not just another mission. These are fantastic missions that, that JPL and the science community have been waiting for for years. So the continuation of those, the full, full funding of those, is something that's extremely important to us. It's not always obvious, but a fairly significant fraction of JPL's work is actually Earth science. Um, it's about 20, 25% of our portfolio is, is using that planetary technology, that um, the incredible technology we have developed for remote sensing of other planets to remotely sense uh, conditions on our own Earth. And we have two very large missions in development right now, one called the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission, SWAT. It's a joint mission with uh, the French Space Agency, CNES. Uh, that continues to be fully funded in the budget, and uh, uh, we're hoping for launch next year if all goes well. We also have a very significant mission with the Indians, the NASA India Synthetic Aperture Radar Mission, uh, also fully funded in this budget, along with a number of smaller Earth science missions. So we really feel that our portfolio is strong in this in this new budget, and uh, we won't take some questions. But uh, Thomas, do you want to say a few words? Sure. Well, just for my voice, was kind of cold for the last two weeks. He sounded a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to just uh, express my excitement to be here with you on this day. Uh, just like you said, the budget that is out there is very strong, and especially strong for JPL. I mean it. Uh, uh, the commitment for to really take advantage of the tremendous knowledge that's right here uh, in Mars and planetary exploration as part of the Artemis uh, campaign is, is a commitment that really we haven't seen. And it's manifested here. Uh, Mars sample return is basically fully funded. Uh, if you compare the numbers 
this year to uh, the previous year, you'd see there is uh, quite a lot of inflow of money uh, coming in there. And you also see that uh, if you looked at the budget, there's one mission we haven't talked about yet, which is just a window, uh, kind of a home on window behind uh, Mars sample return. There's an ice mapper that we're going to start planning on. And it's an international and commercial partnership. Them, guys? We're trying to learn how to get uh, new observations to Mars to look for resources. Uh, you know, for example, that the Canadians uh, want to build a radar. They actually have uh, the money already uh, to do that. Uh, we also need communications assets at the backside of Mars sample return because, of course, we expect that some of these rovers are going to continue. We want communications assets up there. And finally, there's other observations we want to do. That's precisely okay. what that ice mapper is about. It's in the planning phase. So we don't have a full launch. Thank you, Carl. Uh, you know, uh, associated with it yet. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, that's a really important addition, I would say. Also pointing to the tremendous strength of this uh, planetary uh, program. Everything Mike said is is really important. Uh, the one element I'm going to add is I think what we're seeing across the agency is that JPL in so many places becomes a teacher for other parts of the agency and other Units. I go, if you said, if you ask, in the last 20 years, it's actually landed on planetary surfaces. There is uh, very few and far between. And JPL stands, of course, uh, with a head high in that uh, in that environment. So it's precisely because of that that uh, there's elements of that, that in the budget. It's not so obvious. Hey, we expect JPL's help, but look at Viper. Uh, we will count on JPL and their tremendous experience there as we're teaching others to do some of the things that JPL does if you want in their sleep. Uh, we really want JPL at any one point to lean forward and do things that are so tough that basically nobody can even start to think about it, such as Mars sample return. Uh, you can make a sketch, but making that work is in every way as tough as uh, some of the toughest missions we're working on right now, such as Web. And, and other uh, things like that. So we look forward to that, and I think with that, we'll stop. Okay, we're happy to take any questions. All right, I've got a microphone here. I'm gonna get this down to you. Do you guys have any questions? Hello, Maria Cardinal here. JPL has always been on the leading edge, so because of the budget, now we are planning to go to the moon and exploration in Mars. What can you tell us about the world beyond? What's out, um, what are you working on 10, 15, maybe even 50 years out? You're asking me, sorry, I'm having a hard time. This is the time for a question, guys, if you were to have any questions, well, so, you can type them in and maybe I can So ask. what's really exciting about uh, how we prioritize science is uh, we do so in a decade focus process called the Academy's Decade. And so basically the 10 year out for Earth science was just finished two years ago. We're in, right now working with our friends at JPL and, other, and, and elsewhere to build strategies for strategic scale missions. By the way, the first such strategic scale mission, the designated observable, is also in the budget. It's a Can new mission that we haven't had uh, money there uh, in previous budgets, also in the budget. So we want to start the next generation of Earth science uh, observations, strategic scale observations that of course, come at the backside of uh, of SWAT and NISA and some of the Sentinels, Michael Fry, and, and other that uh, right? missions that are there. So we're going to do that in planetary science. I mean, we're starting that decadal at assessment the next year. In fact, the charges was submitted to the National Academies, and then astrophysics were right in the middle of it. Another question. So, so in some of these cases, uh, I'm actually really glad that it's not my job. Uh, I'm sure you have really good figure questions out to ask. That science is more important than that other science. No single scientist should do that. In the meantime, what we expect JPL to do is develop a tool set of technologies and a tool set of approaches that keep, create options for such missions. Without those, ideas are just dreams. So it's, it's organizations like JPL that provide uh, tool sets, for example, for exoplanet analysis, especially the atmosphere of exoplanets, whether those are coronagraphs, uh, whether those are um, you know, other technologies that are out there, such as star shades, it's those kind of technologies that are there, and we'll see whether they turn out to be the highest priorities. How would you have answered, Mike? Uh, very similarly, I think uh, I'll just expand on the last part that Thomas talked about. 
you know, one, one, of, one of the role of our innovative engineers and scientists at the lab is to get this very advanced toolkit ready for prioritization by the decadal survey. And so we've spent a lot of time uh, understanding, for example, how to land on Europa. So Europa Clipper mission is going to fly by Europa uh, at least 40 times, characterize the surface, take photographs, do uh, spectroscopy of the surface. Uh, but we would certainly like to get back and land on the surface of Europa and scrape that ice and see what's there. Um, certainly some evidence that water comes up from the ocean through the ice and uh, is deposited on the surface. Uh, so we've been developing a lot of technologies for landing on Europa, um, for excavating the ice, and for searching for biosignatures uh, remotely. <clears throat> and so that's the kind of technology we get ready for prioritization uh, by the decadal. Um, in addition, as Thomas said, uh, we look at ways to characterize exoplanets, right? We, we still believe we can find Earth 2.0. We'll find an Earth-like planet with, with an ocean and with an atmosphere that's habitable, but we need a technology to analyze that those planetary atmospheres, exoplanetary atmospheres. So we're building a, a chronograph technology demonstrators that clock out the, the light from the from the primary star to let us see uh, the light reflected from the planet, and also what are called the star shade, which is a different way to block out the light and, and uh, allow spectroscopy. So we have a, uh, really a lot of stuff uh, going on. We'll wait and see. I have, I have confidence that some of those missions will, will be in the decadal. Um, but if you were to walk around the lab and randomly interview people, you'd find them uh, working on Venus landers, uh, Venus atmospheric probes, Venus orbiters, uh, Uranus and Neptune uh, flyby missions. So uh, uh, there's a really a, a broad range of things we're, uh, we're developing here at the lab. Next question. Surely we must have more questions here in the room. So many curious minds. <clears throat> And then we'll come over here. Yes, yeah, sir, Derek Stamos. You specifically mentioned just the Europa Clippers a moment ago. Uh, there's been some recent science that says that there are actual plumes of water possibly being emitted from the surface of Europa. Will the Clipper itself have the ability to detect any of those particles and do any kind of analysis of uh, what it might uh, run into while it's uh, flying by the moon? I mean, it should be able to. I mean, it is. It's it's a, a matter of some dispute. There does look like some probability that there have been active plumes. I've done some analysis, for example, with, with Hubble. Uh, looking for these plumes. Um, we do have a, a, a mass spectrometer in the RAM direction, in the uh, direction of flight direction, that uh, uh, hopefully we can we can look at the plume materials. But even if there are not big active plumes at all, or even when we're there, there's no question that the ice cracking and other, other there are other paths to get water uh, onto the surface of Europa. It's pretty clear based on some recent analysis that a lot of the orange colored material are salts and actually actually table salt, actually sodium chloride when the water's evaporated. So that's actually material come up you know, through through miles of ice to get to the surface. So the plumes are one great way to get uh, to get access to the ocean. Same with Enceladus where the plumes are going up all the time. Uh, but it, it apparently flows up through cracks and, and other very small geysers, even if we don't have a, a big one during the mission. All right, you know we have one more question here on the side. Thanks, Shannon. <clears throat> Hi, Arlene Padron. Uh, this is a NASA social event, and what's one of the best ways that all of us with our social platforms can help push out your agency's message and your science today and tomorrow and next week? So tell us, I'll take it back first, and then I'll go on. I mean, for me, the, the way I think about it, it's like it is the best NASA budget in my entire professional lifetime. For all of you who are younger, it's definitely the case. I don't know whether there's anybody who's ever seen a better one. And it's done with the focus towards, you know, taking human explorers out of low Earth orbit towards uh, the moon and eventually to Mars, which is, I think, generally is what basically people around the world and in the US agree is the right thing to do. And it's done without you know, taking the money from science or from other places. It's an all agency budget. So for me, we should really celebrate that. I think the second thing I'm going to add, you know, the budget that we're operating under, if you ask when is the last time we have, you know, you can all do inflation numbers and so forth and constant year dollars, when is the last time we had a budget that high? The answer is before I was born. And I'm older than most people. <laughs> so, so for me, we should be really fortunate. And this, this is a bunch of proposal. There's more to come. Uh, if you look at it, actually in science, uh, we believe that uh, you know, kind of the, the discussion uh, overall has actually 
tended in the last two, three years to increase the science budget in the discussion of it. But I hope the message that you carry is a message of direction, a message of uh, optimism, and really for us as an agency coming together behind an audacious goal, which is uh, to, to really move the ball on both human and exploration and all of the other agencies. Yeah, I would, I would add one other thing. When, when money is tight, you, know, you frequently get into this or that discussion. So, you know, I think we've been driven at times into a human exploration versus robotic exploration trade, uh, or we've been engaged in a industry versus NASA discussion. And I think what this budget does is it really it really says that the, you know, the pie is really larger now, right? We, we, we really have a strong science budget, as Thomas said, and we have this strong ex exploration budget. And I think that's a really positive thing, right? It's, it's this and that, not this or that. And that's the first time we've been in that state for a very long time. Um, I would also remind folks, you know, we, we work very closely with industry. So there, there's nothing competitive between NASA and industry. And in fact, the vast majority of that $25 billion goes back out um, to industries, to, to Lockheed Martin, to SpaceX, to Boeing, to uh, Northrop Grumman, all of these companies. And I think that's a very positive thing. I think we're working more closely together and we value the inputs from industry uh, more than at any time in the past. So I think it's very strong for the nation. And you know, we have to be space geeks and we like space, but you know, it also is a STEM activation um, um, uh, budget. It really allows it, interest in space to, to grow up. And if folks are first drawn to STEM because they see an astronaut or because they see a landing on Mars, but then they go on and form a pharmaceutical company or they become a doctor, that's fine with us. Right? Well, we, want to, we want to draw people in. And I think the visibility of the space program uh, when it's very robust um, is something that really does bring, bring folks in. So it's what brought me in, probably Thomas as well. Um, really, it's, it's the first thing that often you engage in as a, uh, as a child. So, so I think this budget is a really positive thing and uh, I, I think we should, uh, we should celebrate. Would you mind if I just, some, I mean, I, I'm just listening to Mike and I think he's really, really right. So the first one is, hey, this is really a, an exciting opportunity. And the second one is we need people to do it. And who are you who are out there on social media who can really put your shoulder to the wheel and, and make history with us? So for me, that's really a message that I hope comes from JPL and from all over uh, this because that's exactly how we feel. Each and every day, you know, if we think about these projects, we, we talk a lot about that. How do we get the workforce here, kind of equip them to do these amazing feats? So, so for me, that, it's really those, uh, those two messages together. Well, you've assembled quite a good bunch here, so <laughs> I look forward to seeing what everybody out here pr produces after today. All right, we've got a question here in the back from AstroCamp. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so exciting that the budget, you know, we have the people and then there's also people who really want to do it. What advice would you guys give to the younger generation of people who are looking up at this, seeing exciting times ahead? And I think it's cool. What advice would you give to them about pursuing a career working at a place like JPL? What's like the important things for them I guess like the skills, does that make sense? <laughs> so, so to me, like I'm very fortunate to be able to travel. So last two days I was in Florida and I had dinner with one of my former students. Remember I was an educator in my previous life. Uh, and, and you know, I can walk out here and with a very high degree of certainty, I'm gonna bump into another student. Mm -hmm. And I could go to a company in Indiana, bump into a third student mm -hmm. uh, and, and so forth. Uh, what I'm trying to say, is the opportunities that are available right now in the space sector are unprecedented in history, really, uh, other than, I would say, kind of in the Apollo era, right, where everything was cranking up. I think it's just kind of, in, our, in my lifetime, I've not seen anything like this. I think what, what makes people successful and what I learn when I listen to young professionals who are making an impact, they tend to have two things in common. The first one is that they learned how to be really good at something. It could be that it's a material scientist. It could be that it's somebody who's really good at communications. It could be that it's a physicist. It could be they're really good at something. So they have some depth. But they have a second characteristic, which is really important. 
they know how to work in teams. Because what we're about here is bigger than any one person. It's bigger than any one person. We need teams with diverse opinions and backgrounds coming together and create excellent out of people who have faults and weaknesses like I do, like others do, perhaps you do, have, have real weaknesses. We can come together and build these teams that can exceed. And any of our kind of personal limitations because we can trust each other. That second characteristic is more important than ever because now the teams are not just in one center, like Mike said. They're over there in that startup as well, as well in that other contractor that has been around for 50 guess, years, or perhaps a civil so servant center, or an international gonna... community okay. over there in India. I don't plan now, sir. It's a question about are you willing and able to to uh, build teams because that takes humility and that takes uh, a tremendous ability to listen. It's not just about doing, it's about listening too. How would you have answered that? Uh, almost identically. Uh, the one thing I would, I would add to that is that being really good at something sometimes means being really good at being a generalist. So the range of skills that we need, you know, we need some very deep people with PhDs in material science, but we also need some people that are very, I know how to connect material science to fabrication techniques or to you know to, to a certain kind of analysis that we're doing. And linking those deep silos together is something that we've understood to be more and more important uh, the more we work on these very complex missions. So there are many different paths to get to JPL and I think the lesson I would say is that there are many paths. You know, it,